Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now, picture this scene. It's 2012 and you want to build yourself a brand new gaming PC. Intel's quad-core Ivy Bridge i5-3570K is a tempting choice. With four solid cores and plenty of overclocking potential, it makes a lot of sense and it's cheaper than the i7. After all, who needs hyper-threading, right? Pair it with 8 gigs of dual-channel 1600MHz DDR3, as well as a high-end GTX 580 and you've got yourself a top tier system ready to take on anything and everything. If you fancy dabbling in the art of overclocking then an aftermarket cooler is a must and hitting at least 4 gigahertz is no problem. That sounds like something I definitely would have written over 10 years ago, and you know what, it would have been such a great system. It's clear now that the Core i7 would have been the better choice, especially a few years down the line, but at that point the price would have been significantly lower. A 3770K would still be a solid option for a budget rig today, in my opinion, but what about our humble 4 core K series i5? As you can see, it was... Pretty decent back in the day, but if we fast forward a decade or so, we'll be able to get a better idea of its modern potential. Be prepared for the following results to surprise you. My 3570K is overclocked to 4.2 GHz and I've upped the RAM to 16 gigs. I've got it paired with a rather modest 1650G DDR6, a graphics card I feel will work nicely with this processor. Our first challenge for the i5 and GTX 1650, but mostly the i5, is Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. This seems to be a more GPU intensive title and actually the overclocked 3570K seems to be doing just fine. The percentile lows are actually remaining pretty stable as well, which was a surprise. Now I ran this on the Ryzen 3 1200 the other day, another 4 core 4 thread chip, and it played quite well. Given that this CPU is older, I was expecting it to do a lot worse, perhaps not even start the game at all, but here we are. I think the balance is just right with the 1650 as well, and speaking of balance, that's the preset I used at native 1080p with anti-aliasing quality set to normal. Fortnite at medium settings also ran well with over 60 FPS. There weren't as many frame drops as I expected. That said, and in like Call of Duty, the game took a while to load. Quite a while, in fact. In Call of Duty, it was the shader optimization, but here, it was just getting into the game itself. By the time it had loaded, we were already falling out of the sky, and I didn't really have a choice in where I was going to land on the map. I'm using an SSD which will make using an older CPU like this far more pleasant, but it isn't really that unpleasant anyway, especially not outside of games. As you can imagine, Cyberpunk 2077 was quite problematic and it might be worth implementing a 30fps cap. I probably say that quite often in these older CPU tests, but it will make some of the frame drops less severe. That said, the downside of that is that you will be playing at 30fps. Even uncapped, it really wasn't terrible. I've experienced a lot worse. The percentile figures are much more closer together than I thought they would be. This meant that there wasn't really any stutter, but the performance did tank in those busier and densely populated areas. A disadvantage of a lack of hyper-threading and just the older architecture in general. That's important to remember too. Red Dead Redemption 2 now with console quality settings at 1920x1080. This was really surprising yet again. The biggest issues came from within busier areas of course. I mean take a trip to and through Valentine and you may see some dips below 30 but it's not a juddery mess by any means. The game will just sort of hover at around this figure and then pick up again once you're out in open space. There's certainly a lack of consistency but I do believe that an i5-3570K is better than a lot of people, myself definitely included, would assume it is before testing it. It does still have some major problems of course, the loading issues in some games, the general slowdown and the point blank refusal to actually load Battlefield 2042 past the main menu, but at almost 11 years old it sure is hanging in there. It's all about managing expectations really as well. 
Elden Ring next at medium 1080p. 60 FPS is out of the question at any setting, I think because of the older architecture, but performance was by no means bad here and we averaged somewhere around 40. I probably wouldn't recommend going much beyond a 1650 as a GPU pairing these days. I think you'd be wasting your money and you'll have a lot of graphical power to spare. I'm interested in how all the Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge processors compare now, the second and third gen series. I feel a mega comparison coming on. I thought Spider-Man for sure was going to be an absolute mess, but nope, the i5 once again held up quite well despite near enough maxing out. I went for the medium settings again and I thought this was a good sort of sweet spot. I've seen this CPU for less than £20 here in the UK and I've also seen them in low cost second hand pre-builds. What I like about those is that you could probably sell the i5 and then get an i7 instead. Maybe not straight away if you're limited on budget but the i5 certainly has the potential to tide you over for a while and it depends on the games you want to play. It'll be hit and miss for sure. In Apex Legends I played a team deathmatch at the lowest settings apart from textures which I set to high thanks to the graphics card. I'm sure it's going to depend on the game mode you play but the 3570k can deliver some really good frame rates in things like team deathmatch. There is a few minutes of stutter after starting the game when sitting in the main menu but after a while it suddenly smooths out and then the frame times become much more stable. I'd recommend waiting a few minutes before jumping into any game and again that could be another downside of using one of these. All of your friends have already started the game and you're sitting in the main menu waiting for the stutters to subside. Finally for today we have Forza Horizon 5. There may be a few little dips and drops here and there and this is one of those games where things could dip quite a bit when racing through one of the many little towns. That said, over the course of my 15 minutes of play, everything averaged out, well, okay. It's important to remember that this is an aging processor though, and it's not going to be perfect by any means in 2023. Overall, I'd like to expand on that point. There may be some surprising performance results, but sometimes there will be long periods of loading and some horrible dips in performance, especially in more CPU intensive situations. That's a given considering the core count and the older architecture. With all that said, the i5-3570K isn't as bad as I thought it would be, not by a long shot, and not when paired with a fairly modest graphics card. I wouldn't build a system with it from scratch these days, but I would certainly buy an i5 machine with the plan to swap out the processor for an i7 later down the line. It's nice to see that you could play games with the i5 while you were waiting for the better chip to arrive in the post, however. I'm not ready to write the 4-core, four 4-thread four Ivy Bridge chip off completely just yet though, and I think we'll do a few more tests in individual games occasionally just to see how it continues to hold up, because I think there might be some more surprising results waiting for us. That said, if you enjoyed today's video, leave a like on it down below, leave a dislike if you didn't, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.